Because there we can see the idea of God evolving over time among the Hebrews as their political fortunes rose and fell. As one scholar put it, the Jewish God was, of course, originally a tribal deity. But eventually he came to be conceived as a universal spirit, initially superior to other deities. Subsequently, he was proclaimed the only true God. What today gets called God began life as chieftain gods of the tribes of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, before being amalgamated with the Midianite mountain gods known as Yahweh. Yahweh, as Exodus 15.3 declares, was a warrior god and was taken up by the Hebrews for the purpose of ethnic cleansing of the original inhabitants of Palestine. This warrior god later developed into the royal god of the Hebrew people, and as Psalm 97.9 puts it, For thou, Lord, art up high above all the earth, thou art exalted far above all gods. There's full recognition that other gods exist. All that's being said is that our god is the best god. It was not until after the Babylonian exile that Jews came to an exclusive monotheistic understanding of God. And it was this monotheistic conception of God that the Christians took over and set to their own uses. And this idea of God, whose birth, adolescence, and development the Hebrew Bible so faithfully records, is the same God Dr. Craig expects us to believe was around in full working order at the beginning of time, overseeing the creation of 15 billion stars. I mean, how can this be true when the Bible itself tells a different story? Dr. Craig's cosmic creator notion of God is a later development in Jewish religious thought and runs counter to the story left in his own scripture. His view of God, then, acts as a barrier to a full understanding of the historical wealth of the Hebrew Bible. Neither should we assume that Dr. Craig's style of rationally proved God is uniquely representative of Christian opinion. Many leading theologians over the past century have accepted that God is not something that can be proved rationally. Hans Kung admitted that insofar as they seek to prove something, the proofs of God are meaningless. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, while incarcerated by the Nazis, God is teaching us that we, that we must live as men who can get along very well without him. Albert Schweitzer, who has been described as the 20th century's greatest Christian, was also clear that the only plausible God was an unknowable God, to be experienced as a mysterious will within myself. This insight was built on his understanding of the hopelessness of the attempt to find meaning of life within the meaning of the universe. The British theologian Don Cupid is even more explicit when he says, I still pray and love God, even though I fully acknowledge that no God actually exists. <laughs> Closer to home, this is what Dean Richard Randerson had in mind last year when he declared himself agnostic as to the proofs of God. To seek proof of the existence of God in scientific terms is a category mistake, he wrote. He went on, much of the language of the Bible is to be read in ca categories of poetry and image, not as a scientific textbook. To treat scripture as an all-purpose manual, this is in every respect true, is to violate the second commandment, which exhorts people not to set up idols for worship. So not only is Dr. Craig's thoroughly proved God a barrier to more humane versions of the God idea, some prominent theologians are now taking the next step of appreciating that belief in God is a barrier to true morality. Keith Ward asked whether one must believe in God in order to be truly moral. To think that, he said, would be to get the whole thing upside down. Belief in God is undertaking these practices. If God bothers you, he says, forget God and think of a way of adopting a way of self-formation which sees human life in the light of values that are of eternal worth. And Richard Holloway has written that the use of God in moral debate is so problematic 
as to, as to be worthless. It is better, he argues, to leave God out of the moral debate and find good human reasons for supporting the approach that we advocate. It's clear then that many reputable Christian scholars either agree that belief in God is not something that can be proved, or that the proof of God is unimportant or even detrimental in determining one's relationship to the God idea. In this context, Dr. Craig's labyrinth of proofs seems irrelevant. Rather than proving God, his rational edifice functions more as a gallows upon which nobler and more humane ideas of God die a slow death. Let us also remember that this is not a simple contest between the atheist and the theist. Dr. Craig is a 99.9% .9 atheist. He denies the existence of every single God ever conceived, except one. The God he believes in appears on page 341 of my Encyclopedia of Gods. He's a hardcore atheist, right up to page 340, and then again to the end of the book. But on page 341, he completely changes his mind and provides the deluge of argumentation that he has given us tonight. And Dr. Craig has no way of showing beyond merely asserting it, that the God which appears on page 341 is the same as his creator God. Could it not just as easily be one of the other ones? <laughs> and it should also be said that belief in God can act as a barrier to effective dialogue between people of different beliefs. Instead of looking at what divides us, as this moot does, wouldn't it be better to look more at what we have in common? The first and most obvious point that atheists and religious believers share is a common humanity. Now this might sound trite and obvious, but it's worth saying, not least because of the demonization of atheists that is now, in the United States at any rate, reaching dangerous levels. The Canadian philosopher Kai Nielsen, an atheist as it happens, has identified these moral truisms which are shared by atheists and religious believers alike. Listen to them. Truthfulness is a virtue. Promises should be kept. Integrity is something to be cultivated. Human well-being is desirable. Understanding one's situation in life is a good thing. Human suffering and pain are bad. Caring for others is good. Cooperation on fair terms is essential to a decent life. Mutual respect and recognition are essential for human flourishing. The care of children is morally obligatory. Nielsen adds that these moral truisms are our common heritage. Now, they're not enough in themselves, of course. What each of us then needs to do is rework these moral truisms into a coherent view of the world. And at this point, Christian and atheist may well diverge, but it's important to remember that with an effort, we can actually arrive at some pretty important points in common. So to predicate everything on a dogmatic <coughs> belief in God is to throw up a barrier against human understanding and cooperation. Rather than putting barriers up, we should be taking them down. We should be working together to alleviating the sufferings of millions of human beings. Of infinitely more moral relevance to our contemporary situation in the New Testament, are the Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations. As of 2005, someone died of starvation every 3.6 seconds. 115 million children received no education of any sort, and so on. In the face of this catalog of suffering, all Dr. Craig can do <coughs> is split philosophical hairs about whether the level of suffering is gratuitous. I quote him, we are not in a good position to assess with confidence the probability that God lacks morally sufficient reasons for permitting the sufferings of the world. In other words, a death from starvation every 3.6 seconds doesn't count against God because we can't be sure that there is